Beloved, when we come to understand what he's doing and how he cares for us, regardless of what we are going through, we still can rejoice. We still can give him the glory that he deserves. Beloved, I don't know your circumstance this morning. I don't know your situation this morning. But I know my God this morning. I know that we serve a living God. A God who cares for his children. A God who is willing and ready to come to your aid and to my aid. If we can count on him, if we can look up to him, he will show up and he will show us his glory. Amen. Amen. Beloved, Easter is gone, but the meaning of Easter is not gone anywhere. Hallelujah. We still remember that he died so that we can live. I said he died so that we can live. So we need to always remember, had he not died, had he not made that sacrifice, I wouldn't be here this morning. There wouldn't be you here this morning. Amen. So we need to remember that Easter, really, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ means so much to the church and it defines who we are. Amen. Amen. Now that we finished this, we're going back to what we were dealing with three weeks ago. Um, we are looking at some of the goals that we stand for this year and for me, I think periodically on Thursdays we're going to look at where we are and then we can talk because this morning we cannot talk. I mean, I cannot get feedback from you but on Thursdays, we're going to really uh, discuss it in depth and then just try to figure out that since we started this year and since we set those goals ahead of us, what has changed in your life? Are we, have we forgotten about it? Are we pursuing it? Are we tired? Are we, I mean, whatever we're going through, we will try and look at it. You will share your views. We will know where you are and whatever we can do to help us get focused or stay focused, we will all do to help one another. Amen. But today, you remember um, the last time, uh, f- probably three weeks ago, on the third of uh, this month, uh, we were looking at unity in the early church. And on that day, uh, we saw four main points. Uh, the church were devoted to four main points and or principles. And those are the things that we were looking at. We started with the first one. The first one was they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, as we see in Acts chapter 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And we'll look at the four things, the four points. Uh, they were devoted to, uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that is number one, and to fellowship, number two, to the breaking of bread, number three, and to prayer. So these are the four points we are trying to look at. What are you devoted to? Because uh, as we come together as a church, we have to be devoted to something. And the early church were devoted uh, to the apostles' teaching. And remember, Uh, In uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, if we can go back there, we will see something that Jesus told the disciples. So if if you see the apostles or if you hear the apostles being devoted, I mean like being teachers and teaching something, they have what they need to teach. And they said that, and teaching them, this is Jesus speaking, he said, When you had won uh, souls for Christ, when you have gone to make disciples, you need to teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Hallelujah. So the apostles' teachings were based on the commands of Christ. Hallelujah. I just want you to really understand that 
sometimes, you know, when you are talking about these things, people really misconstrue things. They begin to think differently. But I just want you to really understand that if we talk about the apostles' teachings, and this is, this is what I believe, that the church has to teach in a certain way, has to teach on certain things. And we are not teaching. If, if I stand here as your pastor, what I need to teach you is to teach you to obey the commands of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's not my commands, but the commands of Jesus Christ. So, if any time we, we, we are in church, let us really try to make sure that what we are hearing confirms the word of God or conforms to the teachings of Christ or the commands of Christ. Hallelujah. If we begin to do that, we will begin also to see the glory of God. Because as they did this, like, like, if we can go back to Acts. Uh, so, I just wanted you to really understand the teachings uh, of the apostles. They, were de they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. And uh, the apostles' teachings were just simply the commands of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And scripture has proven to us what Jesus asked them to teach the people. And they were not supposed to just teach they were supposed to teach the people to obey. So we don't really say it and then just leave it, but we make sure that we get into your life. We try to really find out, um, um, uh, work it out with you to really make sure that what is being taught is uh, being obeyed as well. Because, um, I mean, people come to church and, oh my God, I came to church. It's my life. You preach and leave me. No, we don't preach and leave you. Hallelujah. I'm not preaching and leaving you. I'm preaching and just coming into your life to find out whether you are obeying. Because that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus left for us. Jesus didn't say that, teach them and leave them. He says, teaching them to do what? Hallelujah. So we need to teach you to obey. Amen. So if I'm trying to talk about certain things with you, don't get offended. Amen. Just love me, amen, <laughs> that I'm obeying the word of God. And you, too, you also have to obey the word of God, hallelujah. And I believe that when we do that, we're going to have a very good time, amen. So that's what we looked at the, uh, on the 3rd of uh, uh, April. And uh, the other three, are devote, they devoted themselves to fellowship, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, and they devoted themselves to prayer. Today, we're going to look at devotion to fellowship. We're going to look at devotion to fellowship. Hallelujah. If you look at the, um, uh, that scripture, uh, the, uh, if you look at the King James Version, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, um, can you look at the King James Version? He says, okay, look, look at the choice of words here. NIV is saying devotion. He's saying they continued steadfastly. Hallelujah. They continued steadfastly. They just were really steadfast in their um, uh, in their, uh, um, how do I say, it? Um, in the obedience to the word, or in the, uh, uh, um, in the way they really uh, worked with uh, one another uh, in listening to the word, in um, not only listening to the word, but also in fellowship, and not only in fellowship, but also in the breaking of bread, not only in the breaking of bread, but also in prayer. So they were steadfast in prayer. They were steadfast in the breaking of bread. They were steadfast in fellowshiping. And again, they were first uh, steadfast in the apostles' teaching. So what I'm trying to say is that we have to be steadfast. We have to be devoted. Hallelujah. Look, there are certain words that are missing in the church today. There are certain words. It, they are missing. Devotion is missing. When we talk about devotion, we're talking about morning devotion. And even the, and the interesting thing is that we are not devoted to that morning devotion. But we call it devotion. 
I don't know whether we know what we are doing. Amen. <laughs> if you are devoted to something, you are careful about it. You are serious about it. You just want to really do it well. Hallelujah. But m- many of us, we are not devoted to anything. We come to church. We are happy in church, but we are not devoted to anything. Beloved, my, <laughs> I love you, and I know you love me too. Even if you don't love me, I love you. Hallelujah. And if I love you, I have to tell you the truth. And I need to really let you understand uh, that you ought to be prepared. Christianity is not just about coming to church. It's about doing what God wants us to do as well. Bible makes us understand in James 1.22. And it's, it's one of my, my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It's a beautiful scripture. Hallelujah. He says what you should do, what we shouldn't merely listen to the word. Don't come to church, just listen to me and deceive yourself. But do what? Do what? Because if you don't do what it says, the Bible says that you are doing what? So some people are coming to church deceiving themselves and they're happy doing that. It surprises me. How people can be happy to deceive themselves. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. So for me, it's important that we don't deceive ourselves. We don't have to just come. But we need to be devoted to what we are doing. We need to be steadfast. We need to understand it. And we need to do it with our hearts. We need to really get involved and do what we have to do. Amen. What is the meaning of fellowship? What is the meaning of fellowship? Um, The Open Dictionary says it's a close association of friends or equals sharing certain interests. Again, I will say, he didn't say an association. He said what? A close association. Hallelujah. Beloved in the Lord, I just want you to be careful about the choice of words here. Amen. Because if we are, if we understand it well, it helps us all. Again, I said the free dictionary says that one of the meanings is a close association of friends or equals sharing similar interests. This is profound. Although it's a worldly um, meaning, but it is profound in a way. And I will show you. Can you put it there for me and then let me just let them see it so I can show them certain things, certain choice of words. Okay, it says close association, close, close. So you sitting here as a church, and this is, if we say that this is a fellowship, we come here to fellowship, then it means that we are close. I know you, you know me. I know when we say this is my close friend, you understand. So, we can't come to church and be enemies. We, can say we, are, we cannot say we are fellowshipping, but we are enemies. Enemies cannot fellowship because they, are not, they don't have a close relationship. So, if you are in church and hatred fills your heart for another person, I don't think you are fellowshipping. And if you are not fellowshipping, then there is a question mark whether you deserve to be in church. Truth has to be told. People must be made to understand the truth. The church would have to, because if we are not careful, James 20, 122 will play out and we will be deceiving ourselves. And I don't want us to be deceiving ourselves when we come to church. I want us to really understand why we are here and doing what we are doing. Hallelujah. That's what I'm saying. Look at the choice of words uh, that defines uh, fellowship. Amen. Amen. Do you see 
yourself as fellowshipping? Hmm? When you come to church, do you see yourself as in a fellowship? Fellowshipping with one another? You see, we can't get an answer. Because we come here with all kinds of motives. And that is why this has to be taught. That is why the church would have to understand from the early days what it meant to be in church. Hallelujah. So we have to have a close association if we want to call it fellowshipping. If not, then let's find another name. Hmm. And it's, it's not of enemies. It is a close association of or so when we come here don't come and lord it over me when we meet here whosoever you think you are and i respect you for what by the grace of god you've been able to achieve in life i respect you and i salute you for that but when we meet together like this we come as equals because we have been bought by the same blood Jesus bought us. You were not bought with Peter's blood. And it's not like somebody was bought with Peter's blood, somebody Apollo's blood, somebody by Jesus' blood. No. We've been all bought by... Hallelujah. And it's the same Holy Spirit that lives in each of us. We need to come to that understanding. Don't come to church and want somebody to treat you differently. And when you are not even ready to treat anybody like that. Hallelujah. Yeah, but you are too hard on us. No, I am not too hard on anybody. I'm telling you the truth. Truth is not easy. Look. (laughs) Truth. Kings even don't understand truth. They don't. And they ask, what is truth? Hallelujah. Truth is not easy. But ye shall know. And the truth shall. Listen, if you understand this truth, when you are coming to church and your shoe is one, you don't care because you are equal to the next one. Who has a $10,000 shoe? It doesn't really matter. Hallelujah. What matters is who lives in me and the blood that purchased my life. That is what is important. So we come here as equals. Mm, Of course, yes. Maybe, yeah, but me, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. You are somebody in Christ. I said you are who? Don't you remember the rich man in Lazarus? Who was in Abraham's bosom? Hallelujah. The point is that you can be Jairus. Jairus has a name. Amen. But you can all, somebody also can be the woman with a blood issue, even if she doesn't have a name. You didn't get the revelation. I said you can be Jairus. Jairus has a name. But somebody else can be the woman with the issue of blood. She doesn't have a name. But Jesus will pay equal attention. Jesus will pay equal attention. He's going to Jairus' house. And then Jairus has a name. But there is a woman who doesn't have a name. And he touches Jesus. And Jesus still stands and wastes time. Hallelujah. I'm saying waste time. Because if, if you don't understand, you think Jairus thought that Jesus was wasting time. But for the woman, Jesus was paying attention to her. Hallelujah. And Jesus treated them the same. The woman had her healing. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. The value. You got what you want. She got what you want. That's fine. Hallelujah. We need to come to that understanding. Look, church can be fun. Church can be exciting. I don't, you know, if you come to church and you go back home with 
downcast face, it's not good. But if your face is downcast, let me tell you one thing. It could be a good thing as well because you heard a word that really touched your heart and you are remorseful of your attitude. Not that somebody hurt you or injured you or said something that you... But you've come to a point of understanding your life and you have so repented that you are down. Wow, did I do this? Why did I do this? I didn't understand this. Wow, this word is good. The word is good, but you are down. It's, it doesn't mean that it's evil, but it means that you are remorseful. Hallelujah. So if you go home like that, it's good. But if you go home just thinking that somebody really looked at you some way, then that one is evil. Mm. I said that one is what? You don't come to church and go home like that. Amen. (laughs) If even I preach about you, that's what you think. But I'm not preaching about anyone. I'm preaching the word of God. If If that word touches your life, Take it. If it is something you ought to change, change. Remember, check with the Bible. If it is true, the Bible is saying that, and that's your life, you ought to change. Amen. All right, so let's move on. So, close association of friends or equals sharing certain interests. We share the same interest in church. At the center of it all, it's you that I see. Who do you see? You don't see your money. Hallelujah. You don't see your sickness. At the center of it all, you see Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is at the center of everything we are doing here. Jesus is at the center of our worship. We need to come to an understanding of that because... Many of us would make that mistake of thinking differently, but Jesus must be in the center of our fellowship. Whatever we come here to do, Jesus is supposed to be at the center. We have to pay attention. We have to focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the reason we are here. He's the reason we live. Hallelujah. So we don't have to really begin to think differently. I don't know why you are in church. You know, some people, when they come to church, they say, well, sorry, Jesus, Jesus is It is not because of money you came to church. That one is not good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen to me. What I'm saying is that some people will say that, yeah, we have come to church. We never come to church. Jesus, Jesus. But me, I'm sick and I'm not being healed and it's Jesus, Jesus. Look, it's Jesus who will heal you. So the center of what we do here is Jesus. If there is no Jesus, there is no church. If there is no Jesus, there is no Christian. Because if you take Christ out of Christian, Christianity, it becomes unity. It is only Christianity because Christ is part of it. If you take Christ out, it becomes I-N-I-T-Y. Unity. I didn't say unity. I said unity. <laughs> and it's, that's even not a word. Amen. I said that's not even a word. So I want you to understand that you are a Christian because of Christ. That's it. Nothing else, nothing more. If you take it out, you are not a Christian. You can what word are you going to? I mean, unity is not Christianity. It is something else. I don't even know what it is. Amen. Now, is this fellowship and even important at all? Yes. Because as Christians, we're supposed to come together. And Bible talks about, I mean, I like um, Hebrews 10.25 so much. And let's go there. Hebrews 10.25 
Not giving up meeting together. We don't have to stop meeting together. We don't have to give up on the fact that we... Today, as some are in the habit of doing, who are those in the habit of not coming to church? The Bible is speaking to you this morning. Hello. Unity is a word. I um, mean, I didn't know. What is the meaning of unity? Can you put it there on the screen for us? Check and then put it there. When you get there, tell me. Amen. Maybe it's something else, but it's not. When you take Christ, it becomes something else that they are talking about. I mean, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the Bible says that not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of, as some are in the habit of, some are in the habit of not coming to church. Some are in the habit of staying at home and giving all kinds of excuses why they can't meet together. But Bible is saying that we don't have to give up meeting together. <laughs> in the Bible, eh, you see that they were as for us, we don't meet too. Do we meet? <laughs> we, we don't meet at all. I'll show you in the Bible <laughs> how they met. Amen. <laughs> Are we here? <laughs> in the Bible, the way they met I don't think we can ever do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know you don't like it, but that's it. Amen. Amen. Bible says that they met daily. They did what? Daily. Daily. What does daily mean? Huh? Are you sure? Hmm? You said it means what? Huh? Some days. Ah. They met every day. Sure. So why are you tired coming to church that you're bastard? Do do? But you want, you profess that you want the early church. You want to see the miracles. You want to see the power. They met every day. Can we come to church every day? Amen. Even some days is now difficult. No, let, let's get this right. Do you want us to come to church every day? <laughs> let me see those who want here, who are saying yes. Hmm? How many? Somebody count for me. I don't want to count myself. They'll think that I'm doing something that is wrong. So, yeah, let me see. How many? Who counted? <laughs> How many? Hmm? How many? I said, How many? Okay, let me see those who don't want to come every day. Nobody. Ah, we don't have neutral people in church, please. I say, it's either we are coming daily or we won't come daily. Let me see. Daily, once more. Those who want to come every day. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, four. Now we've got, 
Who, who, who joined? Who just joined? It's from here. Okay, all right. It's from here. <laughs> Somebody says it's from here. Somebody says from Okay, but we have four people. Okay, so four people want us to meet daily. Okay, that's good. Who are those who don't want us to meet daily? One, two, three, four, five, six. But what about the rest? (laughs) No, you will vote. (laughs) You will vote. Everybody will vote today. Amen. (laughs) All right, that's that's by the way. No, but the point I'm trying to make is that no, you see the problem. We are afraid to make a commitment that will come daily. Yet we want what they had by coming together daily. And not only were they coming to church every day, but even every day. They had different times of coming together. So, like they went to church, I don't know how many times, but probably I think it's about four times because they had four different times to pray. And they, I mean, four or five. But all that I'm trying to say is that their commitment was huge, was great. Today, one of the things that is missing in, one of the words that is missing in the church is commitment. We don't want it. If somebody tells you about, talks to you about commitment, it becomes a problem. We are not committed to one another. We are not committed to the fellowship. We are not committed to the church. We are not even committed to the Jesus we are serving. We are not committed. Because if Jesus gives you a command and you are committed to him, you obey it. But that's not what is happening. I don't know whether what we have today can be called church. Or can be called fellowship. Hmm. I know I'm touching on certain things. I won't take too long. I will release you so you can go and reflect. The next week I'll continue. The reason I'm saying that is that I know there's, there's deep thoughts going on in us. I'm trying to get you to really understand certain things you don't understand. If you understand what I'm talking about, your attitude in church will change. Your attitude in church will change, number one. Your attitude towards your brother will change. One of the reasons we come to church, but we don't see the hand of God, we don't see the manifestation of the power of God, is that we don't understand what we are doing in church. We came to church with motives other than what God wants us to have. Hallelujah. We came to church not committed to what we ought to commit to. We came to church thinking we are better than somebody else in church. But church is, I mean, the fellowship we have is supposed to be among equals. Or people with the same interests. But we come to church and listen, so in a fellowship, our interest must be channeled to the same cause. And in this case, it must be channeled to Jesus. If you are in church and you have another reason other than Jesus, there's a problem. And that is why I want you to really understand what I'm talking about very well. Because people come to church for various reasons. Somebody needs healing, that's why he's in church. Somebody wants money, that's why he's in church. Somebody wants a, I mean, a partner, a spouse, that's why. Some people follow girls to church, others follow boys to church. Just because if, if I go to church, you give me attention. That's the truth. The way he is, if I don't follow him to church, he won't mind me. The way she is, if I don't follow her to church, he won't mind me. So that's why they are in church. 
So everything is supposed to be about that person. And because of that, the person's interest does not align with the church's interests. So he's in church, or she's in church, but her motives are different from what the church is focused on. And therefore, everything in church offends the person. Everything that we do in church offends, because that's not what he wants. Then he will say, that, but this church, they do this, they do that. Why did you join in the first place? Hallelujah. You need to understand what are the interests of this church. If you go to a church and the interest is about money, they've lost it. It is inity. There is no Christ. Because it's not supposed to, about, to, supposed to be about something else, but it's supposed to be about what? About church. We have to have a common interest. We have to share in the same interests. Our thoughts and our hearts are supposed to be going in the same direction because it's towards the same course. Church is supposed to be about Jesus. Hallelujah. He's supposed to be about, at the center of everything we do here. If I'm doing you good, it's supposed to be about him. What he's teaching me to do. Are we here? I just want you to really understand. Because if we get this foundation right, we're going to build a church that is very solid. Built on a solid rock, Christ himself. Hallelujah. Look, there are people in church, listen to me carefully. Please, don't hear what I didn't say. Don't read meanings into it and hear what I didn't say. Listen to me. There are people in church, they think some people in church are fools. Amen. For the simple reason that this man did good based on the principle of Christ and the love that has filled his or her, I mean, his heart. And because he keeps doing that, people think that there's something not right here. He doesn't even know what he uses his money for. He doesn't know, I mean, and then they try, they begin to try to take advantage. I'll share something with you. But I'm going to go into, because I'm going to break this down next week and then try to see um, um, that even when people are doing good, we don't have to take advantage of them. I'll tell you a story. It's a true story, but I wouldn't really bring out the characters for you to really, uh, maybe some people, some people know it, so they will understand it. Anyway, um, listen to me carefully. I just want you to listen to me carefully. Come. So let's assume this, this young lady is in the church. And I want you to understand. I'm talking about the true story that happened. And she goes and then fornicates and have a child. But he's tricking the church that it's a mistake and the person didn't accept and everything. I, I want you to really understand this and understand it very well. And see that people have the heart to do good but don't take advantage of them. So she, dis she says that and she begins to get help here and there. And then she gets a major problem where she lives. She's ejected. Doesn't even tell anyone. Come. You stand here. And then you are not married. I want somebody that is married and the wife is here. 
Because if I use you, somebody will think differently. Uh, Reggie, where is he? Karen and Reggie, come. Go and sit down. Because I want people that are married so that you understand. No, pass here. Come this way. Because your house is here. <laughs> Amen. All right. So these, this is a couple so that you understand it well. You don't think that Reggie is doing something wrong or Kakra is doing something wrong. <laughs> so this girl now says that she's been ejected. Look how me back. Okay, so but anyway, I mean, let's assume she has a child. And then this one hires a car, a truck, puts all her things in, and then comes here, and then when he gets like probably 200 meters to your house, stops and calls you that I've been ejected. And I don't know what I have to do. She calls Karen. And Karen tells Reggie, oh, look, this is it. Okay, what can we do? Okay, 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 right, okay. And she's already by your house. Oh. And she didn't tell you anything. And she says that the landlord has rejected her. So Karen speaks to Reggie. Reggie accepts that, let's help her. But unfortunately, they don't have a place. So Karen has a friend. Amen. For glasses and braha. So Karen calls this uh, friend, and she, this she knows this friend has uh, houses. So she calls. Oh, I mean, I have this challenge, and she says I'm ready to help. So. She has a f fully finished house, three-bedroom house, and she says, I'll keep her there until such a time that she, we find a place, that, like Karen find a place for her. So she, she says, fine. And then they realize the car is even parked around their house. <laughs> Lo and behold, she comes with the key and everything, and then you take her to the house offloads everything and then this woman goes to buy food and everything because it was late as well just to keep and she has a baby as well just to keep them safe so she buy baby food buy adult food and everything <laughs> and provides for this young woman then Karen and Reggie go home to sleep but this woman is still going around trying to see what she needs and how she can be comfortable and everything. So she comes and the girl. But then suddenly, I don't know by what means, she finds out she's chatting with her baby's father. And she said she doesn't have food and everything. There's a big fridge in the house. She goes and opens and she sees a big, like, bowl, pot, cooking pot. She opens it because she knows she doesn't have that in the fridge. So she was shocked. And then Lisbeth opens it and it's peanut soup. You know peanut soup? And the fish, and, and the meat and the fish in it was more than the soup itself. So now she begins to think, what's going on? Is she as poor as she, think, she said? Does she need help as she said? So she begins to interview her and begins to know that. And she's seeing tears that the guy is giving her money. I mean, it's basically everything she said was a lie. So this one calls Karen and says that, I can only keep her here for tonight. Tomorrow morning, she has to go to the baby's father. And she gets angry and begins to destroy Karen. Say all kinds of things about Karen. Because she's in the same church with Karen. And the church people don't know what has happened. 
So she goes around telling people in the church how bad Karen is. Meanwhile, Karen didn't eject her. It's Karen's friend. Who doesn't come to that church? Doesn't know anything. But the point I'm trying to make is that she's looking at the vulnerability of this couple and taking advantage of their goodness. And because Jesus is not a liar, it blows up in her face. And she's not even willing to accept. But Radha begins to destroy this woman. And it looks like this woman, she takes this woman for a fool. And everybody else who hears the story is speaking about this woman, that she's a bad woman. Amen. You see how quiet the place is. But is that what Jesus taught us? What about if this affects this woman to such an extent that she decides not to do good to anybody again? But the truth is that if she does that, I will now begin to speak to her and say that if you have one bad knot, it doesn't mean all the knots are bad. So you can't do that. As a pastor, I have to let her. But then, she has to now be wise. So now, if you come, then we're going to do investigation before we give you. And they say, hey, Karen, you can do it. And I'm going to say, hey, Karen, you can do it. They've been hurt before. They, but they are still willing to do good. But now, they will not act as ignorant people. They will begin to be wise. Jesus said that I'm sending you like a lamb to, but you have to be as shrewd as a snake. You have to be careful. It doesn't mean you have to be a fool. Christians are no fools. We're supposed to be wise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're not just getting up and then throwing things away. No. It's not happening. Okay, you guys can sit down. Like I told you, I'm not going to take too long this morning. But did this make sense to you? (laughs) Hallelujah. Why am I saying that? Because if we don't look at both sides, people will now begin to say that, You're telling us to do this, but people are doing this. Because in the church today, we have both characters. And in the church of old, we had both characters as well. Hallelujah. But God knew how to deal with them. Unfortunately, the discernment in the church today is not great. And there are certain things God is really... Because how many people sit in church and lie? Be truthful, please. Ah, amen. Okay, God bless you for lying in church. <laughs> amen. Okay, no, not for lying in church. For volu- I mean, for being truthful about lying in church. But how many of you guys who lifted up your hands should be living by this time? If we begin, if God begins to apply... And a nice and Sapphira issue, uh, uh, case in church. How many of us will be living? Zero? Okay, that's fine. Amen. Including the pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, what I'm trying to say is that we have to understand that, and this happened, and a nice and Sapphira issue happened under grace. It was after Jesus was gone. Amen. It was the early church. I'm just trying to, and look, what I'm doing is I'm going to really try to bring a lot of those things out for us to know both sides so we can have a balanced situation in church where we know that there will be people in there who will do that. If somebody really, really scam you in church, don't be too worried. Jesus is dealing with it. Yeah, he's dealing with it. He's not killing people because he's not killing people physically like that. But people are being, I mean, he's dealing with certain things that we don't see. So people, 
<laughs> people are in church, they're going through certain things and they don't even understand. They pray and they, but begin, I'm not saying that everything happens because of your wickedness or your sins or anything, but what I'm trying to say is that things happen to people and we need, we all need to begin to look at whether we've done something that needs, we need to repent of and ask for forgiveness or whatever, because many things would happen in church, hallelujah, but we ought to really learn to begin to be a blessing to people and also people would have to begin to learn to not take advantage of people's goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, let's move on. Go to the next verse in Acts chapter um, 2. So go to verse, yeah. Everyone was filled with uh, other many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, I believe that this scripture cannot be looked at in isolation. We have to look at this with 42. Because what was happening in 42, if you can put it together, that would be great. What was, what was happening in 42 triggered this. When there is sincerity among the people, when there is indeed a fellowship, and we are all really looking after one another, caring for one another, really uh, being devoted to the teachings of uh, the apostles or the leadership, which also is in conformity with Christ. And if we are really devoted to the fellowship and not just coming and going and trying to take advantage of people, and if we are devoted to prayer and we are devoted to uh, communion, what is going to happen is verse 43. Hallelujah. Then everyone will be filled... With awe are the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Why? Because the apostles were leading according to God's way. And if they begin to lead according to God's way, God's anointing come upon them. They are anointed and empowered to do great miracles. And when that is happening, people will see great wonders and miracles happening in the church. Where are the miracles in the church today? Where are the miracles in the church today? I get so tired when I keep hearing what are doctors for. Doctors are there to help us. I respect that and I accept that. But I also know that Jesus, I can't accept that and leave the fact that my Bible tells me that Jesus is a healer. So if I come to church, I need to see Jesus healing before I see, I see a doctor heal. If I can trust the doctor to heal me, I need to trust even Jesus more. Yeah, you say we shouldn't go to the hospital. No, that's not what I'm saying. Even because, look, people go to the hospital and the doctors even get it wrong. I like it. Somebody says all the time. They get it wrong. <laughs> Let me tell you, This one is not, and I won't say it. <laughs> because the doctors will take me on. But maybe I can say it. Okay, maybe you understand if I say this part of it. You understand. Even if I don't say the other part, you understand. Jesus doesn't have a wife, neither a husband. So Jesus never comes to you when he's been beaten by the wife or the husband. Look, anybody who's been beaten by the wife or the husband comes to you with a different mindset because he's already in trouble. So, the rest you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Jesus, so Jesus, you know, that's why Jesus never fails. Because he is still the same. The way he came to you yesterday, he comes to you today. He's still the same because nobody has beaten him. Amen. No one has abused him. Look, in 
listen to me carefully. And, and th- th- this, is, this is very important because we need to understand these things. If we don't understand these things properly and we don't, you don't hear me well, you may misunderstand what I'm saying. But I want you to understand that I'm not running anybody down, but things do happen to people. Pe- people get into trouble all the time, but Jesus never gets into trouble. Amen. So Jesus doesn't come to you with any kind of, uh, and, and you know, Jesus doesn't do try and error. Amen. Let me tell you something. Look, let's, you are wearing a tie, so let's say you are a doctor. Yeah, doctors dress nice. So let's say he's a doctor. And, uh, come, come. You stand over there. And you are a drug manufacturer. Listen carefully. He will prescribe what you have told him. He we will just... Exactly. Forget even about that. Let's assume everything is like fine. No, no, nothing. Nothing. He definitely didn't manufacture that drug. So he's telling me as a patient what you told him. So if you make a mistake and tell him a lie, he tells me a lie. Amen. But we know that now I'm converting you. You are now a pastor, and she's Jesus. Yeah, why? I mean, we know that Jesus, God created her in his own image. So, me, I don't know. I mean, but he is the image of Christ. Yeah, because Christ is the image of the invisible God, and we are the image of God, image and likeness of God. Is that true? Okay, so she is. She can be Jesus. Okay, all right. So, um, don't tell me he's not a woman. <laughs> Whatever Jesus was, that's not my, my, my point this morning. <laughs> so, this is a pastor, and he's telling you what Jesus has said. But Jesus is not a pharma, uh, uh, drug manufacturer. Who can get it wrong? He never gets it wrong. So if this one really dwells on what Jesus has said, he gets it right all the time. You can sit down. Hallelujah. So the first point that a pastor should tell a patient, or a member of the ch- church who is now sick and whatever is prayer. I don't care what you think. No, I don't care. I'm not, sit, I'm not standing in the, uh, by the roadside. I'm not standing in a hospital. I'm standing in a church. I first promote Jesus before I promote any doctor. Hallelujah. My first person, the first person I need to promote is not a doctor but Jesus. Because the point is that if Jesus is not alive, I will not be standing here. I am standing here in his place. And because of that, I have to advance the fact that he is my healer. And he is your healer. Hallelujah. These are the things that we need to really understand in church. That is the apostles' teaching. But that is lost today. That is lost. So in church... The things are not today, and it's not everywhere, but majority of the places, it's not depend. If you even try to be too Jesus-like, they're giving to give you names. And they will say all kinds of things. But the point is that, then go and find something and call it another name. You need to call it another name. Because if you give it the name and you, you, you begin to lift up Jesus in the place, when you lift up Jesus, he has to do something. Amen. 
And therefore, if Jesus is not being manifested, his power is not being seen, I have a problem. I have a problem. Amen. So my expectation is, and when you come here, your expectation must be that if I am sick, there should be somebody in the church. If, the, if from the pastor to the last member, there should be somebody in the church who can pray for me. Before I even think about the hospital. You may, look, let me tell you something. Medicine is not a wrong thing. I'm saying it again. I said medicine is not. When Hezekiah was sick and God said, you are going to die. And he said, prepare. And Isaiah went to tell him. The prophet, you know when the prophet left and he went to, Hezekiah went to pray. When the, when God told the prophet to go back, he said you should prepare something and put on the boil. Hallelujah. So the point is that Jesus can teach the doctor to prepare something and put on it. And then you'll be well. Amen. So it's, I'm not saying that doctors are wrong, but it must come from Jesus. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. So if I pray, he will send me to the right doctor. He will send me to a doctor who's going to... Anyway. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. They take them to court every day. <laughs> Are we here? <laughs> I'm trying to really just run around the word fellowship. And then next week, we're going to the things, some of the things I've said, we're going to really break it down and begin to look at the rest of the verses and how they really lived in church and how we have to live together as Christians. Amen. There's a Bible scholar called David Guzik. And he has a comment and he, he says this. He said, the word that is translated as fellowship is, uh, is, co- is the word koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. And we know it because there's a church called that name, so we know it's, it's, it's that's the word that fellowship came out of. Amen. And that word uh, has the idea of association, communion, fellowship, and participation. Hallelujah. And at the center of it, and we learned from the uh, first definition I gave to you, we learned about the fact that there is a sharing element inside there. Amen. So when we come to church in fellowship, we share in the same Lord Jesus. We share in the same love of God. We share in the same desire to worship. We share in the same struggles. So your struggle is my struggle. These are foundational things. I want you to understand that it means that you can struggle in church. You can come to church and still have challenges. People think that when you come to church, you don't have challenges. Revise your notes. Because you can have challenges in church. But there is a place that you go. You go to Jesus. Hallelujah. When you struggle in church, there is a way to resolve those. And you, the, the interesting, the most, I mean, interesting part is that when you struggle in church, you don't struggle alone. You didn't get that one because you don't understand. Because that's not what you do anyway. When you struggle in church, you don't have to struggle alone. Because there should be somebody sharing in your struggle. There should be somebody who is willing to share in that struggle. Who is willing. So, to tell you the truth, if people are really having challenges in church, I believe that there should be people in church who would be able to stand in and and. If they are crying, they have to cry with them. 
They have to be able to do that. We have to have people in church. And, and, and unfortunately, the problem does not originate from the other people. It originates from us. Because we have not, we have lived in church like we are living in isolation. So we don't even get close to anyone, let alone share our struggle with them so they can share it, so they can be part of our struggle. Let me tell you, if I decide to carry this alone, I can. But the energy I will exert in carrying this will not be the same as when he is helping me to carry it. So, I will carry it if I want to carry it alone. But if the dead decides to help me carry this one, he will take part of the burden and I will take part of the burden. And I, I don't get it. I will not be worried the same level that if, uh, if I was carrying it all by myself. Somebody should be there to carry part of my struggle. Someone has to be there. So if you are in church and you are carrying your struggle alone, it's because you want to carry it all alone. Because there should be somebody. But it has to start from a place. You don't have to wait until you get a struggle before you begin to share with other people. Before you begin to relate to other people. Before you begin to really uh, um, um, be friends with other people. You don't have to wait. You have to really, as soon as you come to church, you need to begin to have that kind of mindset and begin to relate to people. The church can be a better place than it is now if we begin to understand these basic things. And if we understand them and we begin to really run with them, we begin to think differently. When we come to church, I am coming to somebody who is my equal, somebody who I can really talk to, somebody who I can really hang out with. I don't see anybody, and that's not disrespect. Please, I want you to understand that it is not disrespect because, listen to me, the Bible makes, you know, these are all stuff in the Bible, and I will show you some of them uh, and the, bring out the scriptures to you uh, next week. Bible says that if, for example... I am a slave, and you are not a slave. You are my master. But you are in church, and I get repented, and I accept Christ, and come to church. I, we, we become equal, yet I'm still your slave, in a way. So when I come home, I should serve you even better than I used to serve you at first. But what happens? We begin to take advantage so Christians can employ Christians now. Because they come to your business and they mess it up. And if you talk about it, they go and destroy your church. Listen, I said if we can get to the bottom of this, the church will be a better place. Because when somebody is helping you, he's never going to think that you'll be able to destroy the, him or her. If somebody, you know, now we are not even receiving angels in our houses because Christians are afraid to take Christians to their house. You take somebody to your house, the next day, the description of your house is the uh, 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 sermon for the church. Amen. They will describe everything. How many cars you have. How many dogs you have at home? And they will say people are in church, they don't even have food to eat. But go and see the way the dogs eat. Is that any of your business? <laughs> Is that any of your business? Did you, are you, are you, do you, your friends, BNIS, your friends, is here. Whatever. Okay, me, I'm old, so BNI still. You come to my house and now you become BNI. You are coming to investigate me. See everything. And then now you come and you put it on the notice board. So people are afraid to take people to their homes. Not because they are wicked people, but they just want to be careful. 
So, you know the problem now? So, hospitality has become a big problem in the church today. People are not being hospitable. And, they, you know, it is hospitality that made Abraham receive angel in his house. In fact, actually, it's God himself that came. Amen. Because the Bible says that when he saw him afar, he went to bring him. When, when Lot saw, because it was something that was in that family, when Lot saw, he behaved in the same way. Amen. And Bible says that we don't have to stop being hospitable. Because in doing that, we have received angels in our home. Clopas and his friend, they asked Jesus to come to their home. And Jesus sat down in their living room on the dining table to eat with them. After resurrection, they were one of the very first people. In fact, they were the first people Jesus hung out with for a longer period when he came out of the grave. Before he met even the disciples. and He really walked with them. The journey was seven miles. I don't know at which point Jesus met them. But looking at the conversation, it was a long conversation. So it means that it was a long journey. Probably half of the journey. So Jesus walked with them for three and a half miles. Walking for three and a half miles is not ten minutes. It's more than that. Now, if Jesus will have time and hang out with you for three hours, that's crazy. And I don't know what you're going to get out of that. Huge blessing. I need Jesus for only one hour. And my life will never be the same again. Hallelujah. So if you get the opportunity to walk with him and then he comes to your house, that is why the people couldn't sleep. Bible says that that same night, when the moment Jesus vanished, they got up, they ran. Hallelujah. Because you need to understand that there is something about Jesus that is not about any man. But the, these people really encountered that because they opened their home to a stranger. Today, we can't open our homes to strangers. In fact, not strangers. We can't open our homes to ch- people we have sat in church wait for 10 years. We still are afraid to bring them to our homes. Don't look at me like that. It's true. Is it not true? (laughs) Somebody is struggling. He needs a place to sleep only one night and there's nobody in church to help them. Because somebody helps and then you see what happens. He's lying. Just trying to take advantage. Just trying to mess up. And then when truth catches up with them, they begin to destroy. I'm done. Hallelujah. This is just, you don't have to, if you want details, I mean, we're going to go into scripture to look at even what I just said, even when Jesus spoke about sharing, you know how Jesus really did with sharing and all that, we're going to really, because when Jesus saw the people hungry, he didn't send them away. If church see people hungry, we don't have to send them away. We need to begin to feed the people. It doesn't mean that we have to every Sunday be feeding people. That's not what Jesus did. If I'm feeding you, I'm teaching you how to also make money so that you can really save your own money. You can really manage your money in such a way that you will not be hungry every Sunday and will be looking for somebody to feed you. Hallelujah. Because if the church begins to feed people and like the same person they're feeding every Sunday, and not getting the person to really manage his own life in such a way that the person will be weaned off that and he will be a willing Christian who is going to help other people. That is not Christianity. That is not Christianity because we have been called to call others. So we've been, if we are being fed today by someone, we have to be trained to earn enough to be able to help somebody tomorrow. We don't have to be people that people are helping every day. If you sit in church and for 10 years, then there's a problem. Hallelujah. But you see, people, and, and when you do that in church, 
because, and I, I still believe that we haven't taught it that well. And because we haven't taught it that well, what happens is that people don't understand. And they think that every day you have to give them something, every day. So one day you don't give them, they think you're a bad person. No, it shouldn't be that. If you are taught the person, and when you begin to teach them to, so we make church so tough. But as, as, as leaders, we need to begin to get to the bottom of this. And when we get to the bottom of this, it's just like somebody comes to Christ and then he, he never wants to grow so that he will also do evangelism. You know, people are like that. They don't want to grow to do anything. So they come to church, they want the seat, they get up, they go. So people come, they want, every day they want somebody to bless them. When are you going to bless somebody? When will you be? Bible says that a church gave, the church in Macedonia, they gave out of their poverty. So, so everybody has something to give. Hallelujah. Look, if you don't, some people say, hey, but me, I don't have anything. They call you and tell you, I don't have anything. If you stop buying the credit, you have something. Hallelujah. If you had stopped buying the credit, the credit that you used to call me to tell me that you don't have anything, but you had credit. How did you get it? You bought it with what? So why are you telling me you don't have anything? You had something, but you used it wrongly. If you don't have food to eat, why do you go and buy credit? And when you say that, they say, eh. no, it's the truth. If you don't have food to eat, why do you go on social media? And these same people, whatever you tell them, they go and post But they still say they don't have anything. But they have money to, make, to bundle data. Hallelujah. There are <laughs> Look, I'm saying that we're going to have fun next week. These are the basics of Christianity, basis of fellowshipping. But we need to really talk about it so that people can understand that some people are not wicked. As long as, so if, if you see, as. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. I'm not saying that if somebody says that I don't have anything, go and look at his status and then find out what he does. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm, I'm not saying do that and then say hey, you bought credit so you don't need anything. No, there are, there are some genuine cases maybe. So I, I just, <laughs> next week we'll look in depth and then we'll try to really see. I want you to be a better Christian. I want you to be, I don't want you to really sit in church and still really not understand because many of us don't understand what I'm talking about. So, you know, some people, I can see some people, they are now saying that, oh, I've been wrong all the while. Yes, of course you've been wrong because the way you've been thinking is not God-like. It's not Christ-like. Hallelujah. And I want you to understand it properly. If you come to church, we are here because of Jesus. And if we are here because of Jesus, then we're going to obey what Jesus is going to teach us or Jesus is teaching us to do. Hallelujah. And that really entails a lot. And church must understand it. If we really understand this and we begin to do it well, you will realize that you come to church with joy. When the Bible says that, I was glad when they said unto me, you tell people that and say you don't know what you are talking about. We know what we're talking about, but you don't understand what we are talking about. But we also have a problem because we haven't told you why it is so. Because if we understand these things, when you are coming to church, you don't come with sorrow. Even if you are sad, you know somebody is going to really carry the sadness with you. Even if you are worried and troubled, you know somebody is willing and ready to carry that burden with you. In the same way, if you are enjoying, you know that somebody is going to really be in church that is ready to share in that enjoyment. So if I'm going to share your sorrow with you, I need to share some of your money too. I need to enjoy some of your money. Hallelujah. It's not only when you are in trouble that you want me to share. When you get, mo <laughs> when you get money, you don't want to share with anybody. Hallelujah. When you, you see, some people, the people that really they share their sorrow with, when they get money, they become their enemies. Because they remind them, hey, 
So they become enemies. Now they have something in their pocket. They don't want even to talk to them. They have good new friends. Amen. Amen. But understand that in church, we are one. Hallelujah.